you guys doing today? All right, I'm Cam. So glad you guys are here with us today at Vessel. So I want to start off by sharing with you guys some ridiculous laws that I found that are in the United States. Some are still around, but some kind of went away, but they existed at one point. And uh, my source is USA Today, so take with that what you will, all right? So uh, I want to share some with you real quick. So in Oklahoma, per state law, uh, you are guilty of a misdemeanor if you are caught eavesdropping. Yeah, that's a law. In Boulder, Colorado, a law was passed in 2001 prohibiting the use of indoor furniture outside. You can't have any couches on your porches, all right? In Hawaii, actually, this is kind of cool. Billboards are illegal because they want you to look at the, all the scenery and stuff. In Georgia, a law was passed in 1961 making it illegal to eat fried chicken with a fork. <laughs> and check this out, a woman was arrested in 2009 because she was caught doing that, but she was later pardoned. So uh, in Jefferson, Missouri, a garage sale cannot last longer than three days, all right? Can't last longer than three days. This one is weird. In Skamania County in Washington, and I looked this up to verify it, in 1969, there was a law deeming the slaying of a Sasquatch to be a felony and punishable by a $1,000 fine and one year in prison. But later, that law was amended designating Bigfoot as an endangered species. Yeah, some ridiculous laws. And uh, the reason I share all that is because we're going to look at a law that, that was ridiculous during this time, during Jesus' time. The, uh, so Jesus healed the paralytic man. That was this episode. And uh, basically, the, uh, the, my title of the sermon is Satisfaction. So Jesus, he heals this man, and that was illegal. He wasn't allowed to heal somebody on the Sabbath. So, uh, but before we get into that, I mean, we saw the episode, and I just want to address this, you know, Simon the Zealot. You know, he was featured in this episode, and it's kind of interesting, because if you read through the Gospels, when they share about all the 12 disciples that followed Jesus, they listed them all, you know, Peter, James, John, but whenever they mentioned Simon, they always said Simon the Zealot, Simon the Zealot, Simon the Zealot, and that was throughout the Gospels and Acts. Now, how would you like to feel, how would you feel if you were memor memorialized throughout history as who you were before you met Jesus? for your junk from the past, like Simon the Zealot. Matthew, we saw in the episode, we see in the episodes, Matthew is a tax collector. He's hated by the Jews, but he's never, he's just Matthew in the Gospels yeah. when they list them. It's just Matthew, not Matthew the tax collector. So like, you don't see, they don't go around saying Mary the demonic, right? Or Paul the Christian killer. Like they don't say all that stuff. I would hate if I was known in history as Cam just the pride ball, that pride ball from Buffalo. You know, like, no, I'm, I, I'm different from that. I'm no longer that. I'm with you, Jesus. But they call Simon the Zealot, Simon the Zealot, just to remind us. So I don't know. I, I thought that was interesting. But in the episode, they made Simon the Zealot and this paralyzed man brothers. Now, caveat here, that wasn't anywhere in the scriptures. But I think it was just a creative liberty in the episode, which is actually kind of cool how they, how they put it together. But um, it was interesting because they were polar opposites. We look at one man who totally ditched his Judaism and totally went to a pagan ritual, which is by uh, hanging out by these miraculous waters by the, uh, the Pool of Bethesda, which we're going to read about. But the other man went to the other extreme and became an assassin. I mean, and he was doing this in the name of God, trying to purge the Romans and all that. So two totally different ends of the spectrum that we saw in the episode. I thought that was kind of fascinating. But... How did Simon the Zealot become a pacifist for God, for Jesus? Now, I'm not going to get into that in this episode because you're going to hear about that later on. But uh, I want to focus on that paralytic man, the healing that Jesus did. So in the realm of satisfaction, right now, the word satisfaction is the state of being content. Right? It's the feeling that one's needs or wants are met. We love that feeling of satisfaction, right? We love being satisfied about something. But we look at this satisfaction is so common in the world. I mean, with, with jobs, we're not satisfied with our jobs or our roles in our companies, maybe relationships, maybe marriages where we find the satisfaction. You know, maybe it's, uh, it's like school or whatever it is, habits. A lot of times people are just not satisfied about where they're at. 
you know? And so, but the Bible teaches us that finding satisfaction rests solely on Jesus. He's the only one who could offer that satisfaction for us. You see, we feel satisfied when we achieve a goal or something or some measure of success in life, right? Like maybe, maybe you have accomplished something that you're like, wow, I worked so hard for this. You know, I, and I, and I, I've arrived. I've, I put in the work and I got the, I'm reaping the rewards now. And you just feel satisfied. You know, whatever that is for you, I'm sure you're thinking about that. So, um, but look, I think it's a fascinating because God, he designed us for a great capacity of joy. Like he wants us to feel satisfied. In Genesis 1, right in the beginning, in verse 27, it says that we are created in his image. We are created in his image and God just wants to experience joy. He wants us to experience that joy. Look, he placed within us that ability to set goals and to accomplish them. Again, in Genesis, you know, by, by verse 4, when he, made, when he saw that there was darkness in the world and he created light, he looked back and said, wow, this is good. This, we're the same way when we, when we achieve something. We look back and we're like, wow, I put in that work, this is good. So God puts that in us. He wants us to be satisfied. In 1 Timothy verse six, chapter 6, verse 6, it says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we bought nothing into the world, and we could take nothing out. So we need to be satisfied with just Jesus alone. Not things that we do, just Jesus. So the phrase I want you guys to walk away with here today is don't settle for less. Don't settle for less. Write that down, all right? (laughs) So we're going to look at verse John here, uh, uh, John chapter 5 here in verse 1. So in John 5, verse 1, it says, After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda, in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. So this Bethesda here, and uh, if you mind sharing that slide, um, the bottom here is the scene from The Chosen that we saw, right, where, Jesus, or, uh, where Simon is coming in and he's approaching his brother. But the top view is actually the, ar- uh, the archaeological finds of Bethesda today. Wow. So it's kind of cool, I mean, how they describe it and stuff. And, you know, uh, what I was reading about, like, there was actually, like, a church that was built before. And then they kind of, uh, they penetrated the ground a little bit and they saw this. They found, they were like, wow, this is, is this Bethesda that we found in the, that, that's talked about in the scriptures? So they uncovered all of that, and that's, that's, what, it, what, that's what it is today. Wow. Kind of crazy. Yeah. So Bethesda is actually, the, the name for that is House of Mercy. So I think that's so fitting because people went here trying to find that mercy, trying to find that reprieve, trying to find that satisfaction from whatever ailments they had, whatever maladies they had. And, um, but check this out, because uh, if you look in the, if you read through the scriptures, if you followed along like, with, the, with the gospel accounts, we look at John chapter 5, 1 through 3, and then it just skips to verse 5. A lot of our Bibles don't, share, don't have a verse 4. And what's interesting is, like, there were some earlier manuscripts that, that included verse 4, and this is what it read. And um, it reads, um, wait, so they were, uh, uh, when the par- uh, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was, he- was healed uh, of whatever diseases that he had. So the common belief here was that whenever the water stirred, and this has a different season, so there could have been days or weeks in between the stirring of the water, people would go down and the first person in that water is healed. That was the common belief. That's why there were so many people scattered around this pool so many people who just wanted that relief. And can you imagine in an age where they don't have medical advancements like we do today? So you got to imagine that, that pool, that area was probably flooded with people looking for something. Flooded. And imagine how desperate they were. Not only just to be there, probably to find some real estate there to wait, but to get into the water first. They had to beat out everybody else to get into the water. Imagine how desperate they were. Desperate. But that was the common belief. Now, whether, whether the people wh- that went into the water became healed or not, I don't know. That's something that I'm going to have to ask God one day. 
Uh, but I just don't know if that was the thing. But the point that I'm saying here is that was the belief during that time. That was the only way of getting healed. So we're going to continue reading in John 5, verse 5. One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he realized he had already been there a long time and said to him, do you want to get well? So this man, and we saw in the episode that he was likely paralyzed when he was a young kid. Like he, didn't, he wasn't born this way. That he was paralyzed as, as a young kid and, and throughout time he grew up and wasn't able to really partake in things that the rest of his peers were doing. And this is just a life like, you know, with these chosen episodes, I'm usually waterworks by the end, but like that opening scene, like showing his highlighting his life, my, I was, I was mushy. Like I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't hold it back, but I was like, man, that, that's probably what that guy was like. Like just throughout the course of time, 38 years, I'm 32. That's, that's way longer than I've even been alive. 38 years. I can't imagine like the desperation that he felt, the hurt that he felt, the, the anger, the mixed emotions that he must have had. And, um, but so we see here that like, hey, maybe, like I think about this, like you, as we watched the episode, you kind of saw that he, he sort of settled. He kind of settled like, you know what, this is, this is my life. He saw his friends playing with the ball, you know, like uh, praying together around like the, uh, the dinner table and stuff. And he just kind of sat back. You know, you didn't really see him asking for help or anything. He just kind of sat there. And it, to me, it just looked like he just became settled. Like he just, he, he kind of got a little comfortable, you know, with, with where he was at. And you, you understand, I mean, I would understand why. I would understand why, but I, feel, I look at this and I, I, I try to put myself there today. Uh, and I'm like, you know what, maybe I settle in my ways. Maybe we get comfortable. Maybe we settle for less. You know, maybe it's something that like, we're like, you know, man, I want, I want to grow in a certain area, but I don't know how. Maybe it's a friend or a family member that's called something out in your character, called out some sin, called out some way that you were hurting them or somebody else, and, and you're like, but, okay, I acknowledge it, but I don't know how to change. So you just kind of settle into the way that you've been doing things week by week. You know, I think about that. Maybe, maybe there's coworkers or people that we can think about that do that. Like, wow, that, that person's just set in their ways, unwilling to change, and I... I've talked to them about this, but they're just unwilling to change. Maybe we know people like this. But so that's what that reminded me of. This guy just he got comfortable. He settled. And we'll see by his response to Jesus when Jesus had asked him that question. You know, so Jesus, he asked him, do you want to get well? He says, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be satisfied? These are, this is what Jesus was asking him. Look, we see that Jesus was dealing with this man. You know, he had withered legs, but he also appeared to have like a withered heart. Amen. Jesus was, this guy was probably thinking like, man, there's, there's nothing that I could do. Like, there's nothing I could do. So let's continue along in verse 7 here. So we see his response. He says, sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Get up, Jesus told him. Pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. <laughs> Amen. But look, let's first address his response here. When Jesus says, do you want to get well? Why didn't he just give him an emphatic, yes, I want to get well? Yeah, are you, are you going to carry me in the water? Yes, yes, I want to get well. But no, he immediately had these excuses. He immediately like, started blaming others. I got to imagine, he's probably like, bro, do you see me? Like, how could I get well? I got nobody to carry me. Are you going to carry me? He probably had some attitude. I don't know. He probably had some, but if that were me, I'd be like, man, who, who are you? Yeah, of course I want to get well. That's why I'm here. You know, but like he immediately had some excuses, like, ah, I got nobody to pull me into the water. Are we like that? Yeah. Do we have excuses? Do we allow outside circumstances to, you know, uh, cloud our judgment? Like, wow, okay, you know, I, I can improve, but no, it's, it's that fault. It's that person's fault, or it's this, you know, it's my job, or it's this, you know, it's right. excuses. This is what this man had. 
So, <laughs> kind of funny. My, so my wife, Joella, we, we have this saying in our house. Uh, well, sometimes if I'm, if I'm being a baby and I'm sick and I'm just not like doing what I need to do, hydrating, she usually asks me, Cam, do you want to get well? <laughs> do you want to get well, Cam? She's now in school for PT, and like if I get hurt playing foot, like I play in a uh, recreational flag football league, play soccer, if I get hurt, and I'm like, oh, I'm hurt, you know? And she's like, well, I've given you a list of things you need to do. Do you want to get well? You're not doing it. <laughs> so you're telling me you're not, you don't want to get well. And I'm like, I'm always busted. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I guess I don't want to get well, you know? <laughs> but so like we have that same, but it's, it's the same way for us. It's like, yes, I want to get well, but am I willing to put in that work? Am I willing to put in the work? What excuses do we make today, guys, to repent of our sin, to not get well? What excuses do we make? Look, I think this guy, he was so limited in his worldview. I mean, he just, all he knew was what he saw. And what he saw for 38 years was the only way I could get well is by going in this water. But Jesus came to deliver him. Jesus came to provide him a new way, a new way of getting well. Look, in John 10, 10, it says, I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. This is the words of Jesus. He, have, he has come to give us that great life. Actually, what's, what's amazing is uh, when Jesus began his public ministry, it says like he was, uh, uh, he was in the temple and he read from the, the scriptures in Isaiah. And he read Isaiah 61. And it, uh, you can see this in Luke 4, but uh, Isaiah 61, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to, procl to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came to set us free, guys. I mean, he came to give freedom to the prisoners, and that's us. We could be prisoners to our sin, prisoners to our junk, prisoners to our bad, unholy, ungodly habits, guys. And Jesus came to provide that way for us, guys. You see all through the scriptures, the words of Jesus. He tells you exactly what we need to do to experience that righteousness, to experience that satisfaction. Let's be real for a second. So I think, like, you know, money's a big thing in this world, right? We, we, we sometimes think that, like, I, I know I'm guilty of this, that if I just had a little bit more money, my problems would go away. You know, life will be a little easier, a little simpler. I'll be able to pay down debt, those student loans, my car note. Like, life would be a little bit easier if I had some money. Maybe I could do some more things for friends and stuff, like go on more trips, experience more of that, that peace and happiness. Like, I mean, am I the only one? Like, <laughs> so I know, like, money could, could provide that for us, right? But what we really want, money aside, what money will get us is that satisfaction, is that security. That's what, that's what we really desire. And when I was thinking about this paralytic man, he wanted to be healed, sure. He wanted to get into that water. That's what he really wanted, but why? Not just to get into the water to swim around, he wanted to be healed. So don't you think if there was another way besides getting into this water that was stirring up for him to get healed, that he would take advantage of that? That's what he really wanted. He just wanted to be healed. He wanted his, the ability to walk again. That's what he wanted. He wanted that security, that satisfaction in God. So the same way, guys, you know, money aside, we can find that satisfaction, that peace in life from Jesus. We don't need the money to get us there. We don't need the money to get us there. So is there a way that we could find true security and satisfaction without having more money like you'd be interested in that right it's jesus guys let me introduce you to him and so jesus he's offering us that satisfaction here today he did yesterday he does today he will tomorrow he is always there for us guys we cannot settle for less do we want to be healed do we want to be healed and if the answer is yes, guys, outside factors should not matter. Other people in our lives should not matter. What matters is us and our relationship with the Lord. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. So 
It just, what we got to do is just whatever Jesus tells us to do. He tells all of us. He told the paralytic man, get up, take your mat, and walk. He tells us, stand up spiritually. Don't look behind. Don't look at your past. Get up and move. Move towards righteousness. Get up here today. That's what Jesus is offering us, guys. So are we willing to do what Jesus tells us to do? What is, and if, if so, you know, if we want to, what holds us back? Let's be honest with ourselves. What holds us back to really totally surrendering to Jesus, guys? What holds us back? So how can we apply this today? Well, I want to invite you guys to go, go places that you haven't gone before. I mean, I know that could be unsettling. I know it was for me when I first started. Like, I, I didn't grow up going to church. You know, it was somebody invited me out to church. I went to UB, and they shared the scriptures with me. They, I, I, I heard of Jesus. I heard about God. I, I believed that there was a God out there, but I knew nothing about him. And so when people, the guys sat down with me and shared the scriptures, and I was like, wow, there's, Jesus is pretty awesome. I mean, like, I've, I've heard about him on TV and from hearsay and stuff, but what I'm actually reading, holy cow, this man is legit. And, and, so, and the things that he wanted me to carve out of my life, sure, in the moment I was like, but this is all I know. Like, is, you're telling me that I'll be, I'll be able to, to achieve that, you know, by cutting this out? Like, how, how do I do that? But I really just had to totally surrender, totally to just be like, you know what? All right, Jesus, you take the wheel. I'm going to do it your way. And I could confidently say this was 10 years ago. Man, my life, I, that was my, the best decision I've ever made was following Jesus. The greatest decision. You know. I don't know where I'd be today, you know, having that same worldview that I had 10 years ago. Man, I, this is my invitation to all of you guys. Dig into the word. If you don't really know where to start, I'm sure somebody here will be willing to guide you. Be more than happy to. I know I, I get so much joy helping people uh, learn more about Jesus in the Gospels and, and, uh, and uh, the New Testament, the Old Testament. It's the, one of the greatest joys I have in life is helping somebody else to cross from that darkness into the light. Yeah. To help other brothers and sisters come with me to heaven one day. Because this life is nothing. This life is going to be over like that. Yeah. You know, what really matters is eternity. That's what, that's what matters, guys. So are we willing to put in a work? Let's not settle for less. So one last verse I want to share. It's uh, the words of David in Psalm 73, verse 25. It says, Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. You see, no more waiting for a better season to fully commit to Jesus. He committed to you already, guys, by dying on the cross for us, by being brutally murdered, you know, being mocked. He did all that for you before we even knew what he did. Before we loved him, he's loved us. So we got to look at that and not waste that opportunity because he, he already set it aside for us. He wants us to, be, to enjoy satisfaction in life but, but he wants us to be with him in heaven for all of eternity. So as we reflect, as we take our communion, as we reflect on the body and blood of Jesus, let's really think about, man, what are some ways that we could grow? Let's be honest with ourselves. Let's ask our friends, our loved ones, like, hey, what can I grow in? And let's make that, cha that change today. Amen? Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, first of all, we're so grateful for Jesus. Lord, that he comes to give us that new way, Father, that he comes to heal us. It doesn't matter what we've done, who we were, Father. In you, we are a new creation. You don't hold our past against us, Father. Father, you, uh, you just want us to be united with you. You want us to experience that satisfaction, that security, that joy in life, Lord. Lord, we are so, we are so grateful and honored to afford that. I pray that our lives can glorify you, that we can start today, Father. Lord, we love you so much. We pray this all in your son Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today as we continue on our chosen challenge. If you guys want to get more involved, you can look in the link below where you can find our syllabus, which will highlight the different scriptures and the episodes that we'll be watching for the week. And if you missed any previous episodes or maybe you just want to give it another watch, you can look on our YouTube channel. We love you guys. Hopefully you have a great week, inspired week, and a week where you continue to realize how we are chosen by God. Have a great week. We love you. Take it easy.